So there's a bit of a gap here. There is a time, as I say, where hot yoga is produced, where it's kind of an underground tradition, and the tantric um, orthodoxy falls out of power. Um, it's a period in which the European incursion happens by 1498. We have Vasco da Gama landing in Calcutta. As you know, the date 1492 when Columbus discovered America. This is kind of the, what we call the age of discovery. It's a time when this really intense understanding that's been incubated in Europe through the Renaissance, this powerful ideas of the individual and the systemization of life that will be become secular culture, goes out into the world. And we get the age of discovery. We get all these European conquerors and travelers moving out into the rest of the world and bringing this new awareness. Of course, it's also coupled with um, Western religious traditions. But it really is a new consciousness, and it really powerfully empowers Europe to influence and control pretty much the whole planet. The other day I was trying to think, is there any country on Earth which wasn't at some point ruled by some other country from Europe? And I can only come up with two countries, Thailand and Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what happened in Europe was so seminal for the rest of the planet. Very, very powerful. And um, so we have that period in India. And in that period, um, the yogis are kind of uh, even more strongly made outsiders. And because there's a lot of tumult in the Indian subcontinent, you not only have these different warring factions of Muslims and Hindus, but you also have now the Europeans thrown into the mix. And they're trying to consolidate control. And they're trying to establish trading partnerships that are preferential, and so they don't want to be ruled by the Muslims. I mean, it's mostly the Muslims that they're dealing with. Um, and then you get these these bands, the war, the yogis start to band together, and it's kind of a dark period for yoga, because a lot of these bands are about worldly power, and they're using their yogic powers to form uh, powerful soldiers, and um, uh, kind of, uh, it's kind of, period of racketeering, kind of yoga mafia, where they're controlling, <laughs> they're controlling trade lines, they're controlling kingdoms, they're, they're selling their powers, their um, armies, like on the, on the military market, they are um, mercenaries and whatnot. So that period kind of coincides with uh, British history in India, the British East India Company is formed in 1600, and by 1757 they start to establish administrative control in the country through the Battle of Plessy. And from that period on, the British East India Company, literally a company, talk about how bad multinationalism is now, in, in that period you had a country or a company running the whole country. So the British East India Company gradually consolidates control over India. And at the cultural level, what is happening is that modernism, this understanding of secularism and modernism and the world of ideas and the, the integrity of the individual and the capacity for social transformation is coming into the Indian worldview. And that is totally new. Those things are very, very new in their quality. And unlike the Muslim invasion, which was kind of two cultures meeting on the same level, now you have this, this, these new ideas which are so radically transformative, which attempts to kind of pop India out of a certain path of evolution to a higher path of evolution. And this is an idea that was actually very current in the 1800s among Indian intellectuals. They were looking at their own country and they're going, you know what, we've kind of been asleep. We haven't really been on the cutting edge of what's possible for our culture. And the, what was happening in the European, European nations was so present to them. And they were able to say, you know, we kind of got to get, get on. You know, we saw this also in Japan, right, with the Meiji dynasty. They just kind of jumped into the modern world. They shifted their entire culture kind of be up to date with what was going on in Europe. We get the seeds of that. We don't get the same degree of powerful transformation in India, but we get the seeds of that in India. And it's mainly in this society of um, thinkers who are called the Brahmo Samaj. And out of this, the reason this group is important is this guy Swami did the Tananda will come out of it. He's kind of a huge force in world yoga. He's probably the primary force in world yoga. But we get this guy who's called the father of modern India, Ram Mohan Roy, and these guys are all kind of cultural bridge makers. They're not purely Hindu. They come out of a class
class of Indians who were Western, partially, at least partially Western educated and who spoke English. And they were able to critique their own culture from a Western point of view. And they were also able to critique Western culture from an Indian point of view. They understood the strengths of their own culture. They understood their profound insight into the transcendental nature of human experience. And all of the sciences and religious exploration that their tradition held, they understood their authority. But they also understood that the West had something to teach India. And a lot of those things had to do with social reform. The way women were treated, the way the low caste were treated, the way that um, there were certain um, oppressive laws in culture or in ritual practice which were not helpful to anybody. So these guys were the change agents. They were the forerunners of modern India. The people who came into power when India became a nation, a lot of them were rooted in the traditions and practices of the Brahma Samaj. So you have these, this powerful guy, Ramohan Roy, who translated the Upanishads, he spoke Persian, he spoke Hindi, he spoke English. He got associated with the, um, the, um, the uh, missionaries in India who were more liberal, the um, Unitarians. He was often identified with the Unitarians. He came to England actually to share his ideas, and he died in Bristol, England, which is kind of rare. Not a lot of Indians traveled out of the country in this part of history. Kesav Chandra Sin was an indirect disciple of Ramohan Roy, and he was this really charismatic character who was trying to blend Christianity and Hinduism and create a new form, which is called the New Dispensation. And he had a follower called Project Chandra Majumdar who came to America in the late 1800s, and he was, we might say he was the first guru to come to America. Uh, Kesar Jenderson went into England and preached throughout England. Of course, the connections to England were powerful because England was really the country. So these guys are important because they show to us that there was a, a certain template of transmission of yogic ideas and Indian ideas to the West. And it doesn't come in the way that you might think about it typically. You think, Oh, okay, you had some Indian, in, some uh, Indian yogi in a cave who decided to come to America and teach us an enlightenment. It wasn't that. Again, these guys lived in the cities. Most of them lived in Calcutta or Madras, the centers of British power. Most of them had gone to the universities that the Brits had set up to raise up a class of Indians who could help rule the country with them. They were called the Bandralak, or the Babus. They were like hybrid individuals. They straddled the world of the East and the world of the West. They spoke English. They understood the West so they could come to the West and speak the West language and influence the West. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah. If you give it half a thought, it's not going to be some guy who doesn't even speak English, who doesn't know anything about Western mores, who's going to come to this country and have any effect on us. It's not going to make any sense to us. It's going to be somebody who actually already knows the West and is able to take it for what it is and influence. Influence it. So that's who these kind of guys were. And the, kind of the top of the food chain was Swami Vivekananda. We'll take a look at him in a moment with the next slide. In fact. 